Alright, so here I am trying to uh, hold these pages open on this book as I make a response video to Stavros who wanted to uh, have more detail on that situation with 5th uh, generation warfare, transhumanism, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and why the old models of sorcery apply to modern uh, artificial intelligence based conflict and artificial intelligence based uh, conflict management. Uh, one of the things we have to realize is the culture that has spawned a lot of uh, uh, modern computer programmers is generally Asian, okay, generally East Asian, Indians, uh, that sort of a thing. Um, and we look at computing technology that was developed during wartime, the first serious computers uh, developed in World War II was uh, 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 apparently a type of a 64-bit processor called, uh, in, that was developed by the British uh, as a code-breaking machine. At least what they told us it was, it was a code-breaking machine. And supposedly it was for breaking German Enigma machines. But let's look at, it, it was a machine that was used by their intelligence people during the war, and um, it was used to figure out what the Germans were doing. Now, the British had a long-standing uh, tradition in the British Empire, uh, dating back to, I don't know, it's uh, 1600s or so, but even going back to the Crusades, and the, uh, their adoption, especially in Scotland, of the Knights Templar, of cultivating what they felt were magical practices, because they felt, okay, at some level there's something to it, but we're not quite sure what it is. Uh, th this is a copy of the I Ching, which is basically the abridged copy. And it was very difficult to get a full translation. I, I don't even have a full translation. This is, this is kind of like the fortune teller's version. And what it talks about is these, there's 64 combinations of this binary thing, which uh, they, they call hexagrams. Okay, so there's, there's 64 different ways that you can take this thing, and it's either going to be an a odd or an even. And one line represents odd, the other line represents even. So, um, you know, on this thing, it's it's kind of based on uh, coin tosses or item tosses, where you're going to get either an odd or an even. And then the significance of the odd or the even would represent something out there um, that's not entirely random, because the items coming up is not exactly random. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a matter of measuring coincidence. So whether you toss something it's uh, once or twice, or I, I guess there's another method you could do it six times, a lot of the times this would work is somebody's throwing a religious object into it while thinking about a question or writing a question, framing a question, and then <clears throat> it, it's more like a unit of measure for the cosmos, and what they're finding in the interpretations for each one of these random generated uh, occurrences, or, or uh, one of these generated occurrences, that by l interpreting everything, they can come up with a number of interpretations based on the positioning of a coin toss, or a random occurrence, or, or an object toss. And interestingly enough, the computers at Bletchley Park were based on this to some level. There, there was a fascination in England in the late 1800s with that sort of metaphysical type stuff. A lot of it got uh, accredited to, to Crowley, who, um, you know, let's face it, this guy was a sicko. But there were a lot of other people. He's the one that's most talked about or remembered of, of that period in England, but he's the one that was, um, uh, you know, seemed to be most talked about. But the other thing is, it was a, there was a general knowledge among kind of a subculture there of how these things worked. And what's interesting is, when they came up with the very, very first computers, they were incorporating this system into the very first computer. So this is long before what any of us would even consider capable of artificial intelligence. So in doing a coin toss or, or measuring 
uh, occurrences that could be random, but maybe aren't random, but are the, the concept that the cosmos, everything's actually interrelated in some way, um, they were on to that. And they were on to that because the ancient Chinese were on to that. What's interesting is that when we get to an English translation of the I Ching, uh, all you get is a short version. You don't get like the big fat wisdom book ver version. And that's referenced in Sun Tzu's Art of War, but it's usually not included in these, okay? All, all, all the English language translation we wanted to play around with was a fortune telling thing. Uh, kind of interesting like that. Um, I couldn't really tell the future with any of this stuff, but there were things I could tell about the present, which is, which is kind of interesting. So, again, it, the reason I, I wouldn't really play with that anymore um, is, you know, we have access to the Internet. We have access to news. We have access to technological replacements for the speculative nature of what a lot of these interpretations might be on something like that. And so we're replacing superstition with the technology, but it actually works about the same way. Uh, you know, binary system, connecting or interconnecting things which may not seem connected, but maybe are, and, and that's kind of how that works. The thing is, is when we get into some of these ancient philosophies, um, the... Uh, and comparing computer languages, that that's why in that movie, The Matrix, um, when somebody's looking at the code, right, the little green up and down thing, it's all in kind of like Chinese, or it's it's not in English, it's not ordered in English, it's not working that way. Um, the idea was that whoever created The Matrix would have spoken or, or had their own logic process work in a different language, and because of that, um, somebody, let's say, who's versed in English isn't going to fully, fully comprehend every aspect of it, but they can function in the matrix. When we look at the, um, you know, uh, uh, modern studies of the Bible, we know that the vast majority of that was written in Greek and Aramaic and ancient Hebrew, and so people will study and sometimes retranslate that based on how that goes, but what we're looking at is um, morality stories, we're looking at advice, obviously, we're looking at um, uh, the w word of God and telling people how to live, but we're, we're also looking at a lot of things which change, uh, uh, just, just over the course of a couple of verses here in uh, the g gospel, er, or in Matthew here, um, we're, we're talking about the red letter stuff where Jesus at one point is basically kind of sort of rejecting to help a non-Jew. And then after her insistence, uh, he's, he's like, well, okay, I guess you got a lot of faith, so we'll heal you or we'll, we'll cure your son of the demon problem. And, but what we also realize is that he didn't seem to have a carved in stone policy or behavior on that. And, and that's one of the many things that a lot of people uh, will point at in the Bible is that this whole cosmos thing, this whole will of God thing, apparently changes according to somebody's behavior. It, it doesn't always stay the same. Uh, earlier in there, Jesus is talking about, you know, interpretation of moral standards, which is one of those things a lot of rabbis sit around and talk about. That's why most legal type stuff, would go back to rabbinic teachings and law and all that kind of stuff. But when we get into computer stuff, here's another interesting thing. In um, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, it's like, you know, I just kind of flipped open, got through a couple of pages here, um, and they're talking about a teacher, you know, how to get somebody's teacher in the head. Now, uh, a, a lot of Christians are going to say that, um, you know, a, a, a application of conscious transference at time of death, and this goes over how to use sound voice type of meditation, basically brain tuning, uh, and all of that to transfer consciousness from one biological body to another if possible. Sometimes they would claim that they can transfer consciousness 
from a biological body to an object. Now, whether or not they're going to interpret that idol as something which would communicate with people later on or, or transfers to this object and then they transfer it to a fetus or something like that. The thing is, apparently pretty long time ago, somebody was studying a process by that. They, 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 they had some concept of a process. And we understand that those same people now, people who, who grew up in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, or people who grew up in the Indian Hindu Buddhist tradition, in the Hindu tradition, and basically one of the differences between other Buddhists and the Tibetan Buddhists is it, it kind of combines a Hindu trans, uh, thing with Buddhism, sort of, uh, um, is that they were, they were onto this concept of transferring a mind from one thing to another, of copying a mind from one thing to another, of uh, uh, all this stuff, which is now used in computers, which is interesting because I, I work for a lot of people who work for Intel and Google, and uh, a lot of them are from that part of the world. And they seem to think things like this are relatively simple because they grew up learning it. And that, I, 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 I mean, it's a lot of them, okay, most of them. I, I, I could say that I've not worked for a, uh, uh, I don't think I've worked for American-born white people who work for those companies in the design and software, firmware type stuff. I, they're pretty much all India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Tibet, uh, it's pretty much all of them, okay? They're well-versed in this, and they, they're the people that program computers. So, is there morality stories in here? Well, there's speculation that Jesus had traveled in that part of the world at some point uh, prior to his ministry at age 30. The other speculation is that the wise men from the East were also from that part of the world. Now, whether they were Taoist or Buddhist or, or, or from this other thing, it's, I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, I studied comparative religions as part of getting my sociology degree back in the 90s. So that's, that's where a lot of this stuff is, is from. Uh, what we do know is that in the Christian tradition, there's a fair amount of documentation or stuff being dug up in the Dead Sea Scrolls that they're coming up with that um, we know it wasn't included in the Bibles for various reasons, whether or not somebody could verify it, whether or not it matched other other texture, uh, uh, other scriptures, other things. The other thing that's been going on with a lot of that is that some people decided that some stuff would be for public consumption, other stuff would be made available to people who want to study more in depth in the context of all of those things. For example, in the Orthodox Church, there's an Orthodox Catechism where people learn the history of the Church and the history of certain actions, and, and there's a mystical aspect of it. Uh, I made the argument in um, class, in, in the classes on, on comparative religions, that if, if you have a, a religion which does not um, reconcile the supernatural and mystical, then it's not a religion, it's a club. And so that's, you know, that, that's mine. And, and now, there were a lot of people who disagreed, a lot of very uh, uh, credible people who disagreed with that, but my personal opinion is that if it doesn't reconcile the mystical and supernatural, it's, it's a club, not a religion. Now, as far as this stuff goes, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff in here about transferring from one consciousness to another and all that. And these guys are talking about this stuff, uh, you know, apparently pretty long time ago. I mean, before the age of computers. We do know that the very first computers were basically off of this little binary system thing here. It is 64 combination binary system and, and somebody's assigning meanings to all of that. And that very early in the game, they felt that some sort of netherworld consciousness could influence that or communicate through it or, or do something through it. But it's still one of these situations where there's, there's like a lot of 
somewhat contradictory uh, interpretations on a lot of this type of thing. But it would make sense that if somebody comes up with one that's far more complex, that it's it's not going to be as contradictory, that it might be more functional, that it's not, there's not as much guesswork in it. And, and that that would involve increasingly complex uh, calculations, which are also increasingly specific, and that are somehow related to time, time management, time manipulation. And that's where people are getting at with these conspiracy theories, which... I, you know, there could be something to it that somebody in Southern California has been developing some kind of super big, uh, 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 what they feel is a machine god AI, and that a lot of people have conceptualized it since the first computers came out at Bletchley Park in England because they were, I, I personally think it was kind of a side project they were working on. I think they were trying to figure out some way to have a personality that would come through a machine and and not have it be influenced by the personality of a person that it's being put through. Because what the Tibetans were really after on their thing was trying to find what they felt were higher beings that were beneficial to them. Not, and what a lot of people who would say, hey, this is something bad to mess with, is they would claim, well... If you get it wrong, and sometimes if they get it right, because it's the intent of some of the people, is that it would lead to demon possession. Uh, Jesus acknowledged that demon possession would happen, and in some quips in what he's saying to people was like, oh, gee whiz, that's your problem, deal with it. Uh, and in other cases, they would say, okay, cast the demon out, and we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Um, but in many cases, he would say, okay, well, you made it, you deal with it, or you invited it somehow, you deal with it. That's one of the questions with the, with the, um, the AIs, hostile adversarial AIs, why they're created, who they might be going after, and what the defenses are. Now, I made another video series about the art of unplugging, which is, as long as those things are computer-based, as long as they're based on a communication system, the computer system or something like that. Um, when somebody has had um, spiritual problems, demon possession problems, ghosts in a house type of stuff, one of the things that a lot of spiritualists will say is, okay, grab all that supernatural crap out of your house and throw it away and burn it. And uh, uh, like there was something I, I heard from a sermon in Florida, evangelicals, uh, had a kid who was always sick or going crazy and all this other kind of stuff. And they they went to the psychoanalyst, you know, like like this is an older psychoanalytical book, and they're trying to deal with all that, and they couldn't get anywhere. So they call the evangelist, he goes in the house, and he sees a bunch of these um, African masks on the wall. Okay, like, 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 and, and they said, well, where did those come from? Well, the witch doctors give them to us when we visit the villages. He said, well, take all that crap out of the house and burn it. Uh, anything that's some kind of African idol thing, take it out and burn it. And so they take all that stuff out of the house, they burn it, and all of a sudden the kid gets better. Well, there might be something to that. There might be something to that, but then the question is, in the defense of a transhumanist adversary or, or a world where everything's plugged in and somebody's kind of unleashing these things out there, the defense mechanism is, okay, how do you get all that shit out of your house? How, how do you do that? Well, you have to be capable of having a defense mechanism, which is running a life unplugged or limiting the amount of plugging in that you have as a defense mechanism. And so that, that's kind of what I was getting at that. I, uh, hopefully that explains a few things.